to the Flow Track podcast presented by Wonderful Pistachios. I'm Livek Pony, joined with Ashley Titians, Corey Mall, and Juliet Whitaker. We are back at the paddock here in Eugene, Oregon, kicking off day number six of the U.S. Olympic trials. And I know you guys are just craving for more content, so make sure you come and check out our website at flowtrack.com. Also, our YouTube channels, social media. We're putting out all the great stuff. So you know where to find us. But without further ado, I don't want to waste any more time because we have Juliet Whitaker here. She is one of our faves. I know we're not supposed to have faves, but she's one of our faves. And she's a sophomore from Stanford, and she punched her ticket to the Paris Olympic Games in the 800 meters when she finished third in that race with a personal best of 158.45. Juliet, congratulations, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so I know Ashley and I asked you already, has it sunk in yet? But for the people back at home who want to know, has it sunk in yet that you punched your ticket? No, not at all. I like keep like having to like look at my phone when I wake up in the morning and like check the date because I'm like, wait, like has the final happened? Because so I was like, this would be a horrible nightmare if I wake up and like thought that I made it to the Olympics and then still had a race. So no, it has not sunk in at all. And I don't think it's going to until like probably I touch down in Paris. Amazing. Oh, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, okay. So I was, I know we had a chance to chat a little bit throughout the course of the championships, but from your perspective, because the 800 meters, I've been talking about it months leading into this, this event, that it's the most anticipated race of the whole Olympic trials. Argue with me, I'll back up with some points. But from your perspective, a lot of things were going on. We saw a thing mo fall. There was just a lot of changes. It was fast. So from your perspective, from your point of view, what was just going on in that race for you? Yeah, for me, I was really just trying to, like, not get too, you know, like, focused on all the people that are in the race, all the accolades that they had. Like, it was hard, obviously, you know, in the beginning of the race when they are announcing all the athletes and they're, like, naming all these, you know, insane accomplishments. And I was just trying really not to focus on that because, obviously, you know, the 800 has been a very deep field, like, in the NCAA this year, but also on the pro level as well. Um, so I was really just trying not to focus too much on that and just kind of, you know, know that this could be, like, anyone's race. Like, it always, like you know, it really, to a certain extent, doesn't really matter what you've done up until this point. It's, you know, who's the best racer on that day. So I was really just trying to stay in the moment um, and just, like, not count myself out too early. And it really came down to, you know, anyone's race there at the end. I mean, obviously, we saw a thing Mo fall, but then just there were so many players up there at the front, and you were the one that had a great kick there at the end to, to cross the finish in third. And I remember seeing you cross the finish and like, <clears throat> I think of anyone so far the trials, like I've never seen someone with so much shock that like they made the team. Like, can you just describe a little bit about, you know, that final hundred and then you cross the finish line and realize you, you took third there? Yeah, coming home in the hundred, like I think I was in fourth at that, or maybe I was in third, but Allie was behind me about to like kind of make her move. Um, and I definitely was just like, oh my gosh, like I'm really close to like making this team. Like, you know, like I could really do this. And I feel like I had had that, this like, last hundred like moment like replay in my mind so much leading up to the trial was just like really visualizing how it would go and I was like this is crazy it's actually like playing out um and I was just like really happy that I still you know had a kick um at the end and yeah I don't know I was definitely full of so much like shock and just like joy when I crossed the line you know like it's one thing to you know be wanting to make the Olympics but to actually do it is like a whole different thing and so I feel like up until this year specifically like this outdoor season I hadn't really ever thought that the Olympics could be that much in reach. Like I was always like, oh, like I want to be an Olympian, but like, you know, so does everyone else. Like um, it wasn't until I feel like recently that I was like, wait, this could actually happen. Before any big event, conversations are always about time. Like what, you know, an athlete has done on paper is how we kind of structure the way we talk about events, but that's obviously not always the way it shakes out and you're, you're co commenting on it basically. Um, how do you get past that as an athlete to go in there and not withhold re like reservations about sort of what time means? And it's about competing, right, for you. So how do you get past sort of those mental barriers that sometimes add up? Yeah, it's definitely pretty hard. Sometimes I get caught up, I feel like, a lot on like the time. Like I definitely like, you know, going into the finals, like I maybe had one of the slowest PRs. Um, but I really, again, just try to focus on the fact that like it's anyone's race at that point. Like it's really just like about what you do that day. Um, and I also like knew like, you know, I'd only run like a 159, like, oh, but I like that was in high school. So I was like, I feel like I could run faster. Like it's really not about the time on paper. It's like more about like how I'm feeling that day. Um, Cause I definitely felt like I had a PR um, kind of in the legs. So yeah, kind of just tried to get excited about what I could do. 
I kind of have a follow-up to your last comment about just kind of the belief in yourself that you can make this team. When was that for you? Was that at NCAAs? Was it through the rounds of trials? Like, when did that click that, okay, I can actually do this? Yeah, I think after NCAAs, um, I definitely had a lot of confidence just with, like, how I competed. Again, like, not a PR, but I was like, okay, you know, if I can make it through these rounds and, you know, have this kick at the end, like, that's really all you need, like, for the trials. Um, and so I feel like once I got to the trials, like, my coach just kind of kept, like, bringing it up, like, casually. Like, you know, like, you could really make this team. Um, and I feel like I wasn't really thinking about it a ton until he started just really saying it very, like, confidently, but also, like, very, like, casually and just like nonchalant like it wasn't like this big like scary um daunting task like it was kind of just something like you know like i, I think you can actually do it um and i was like yeah wait maybe i can <laughs> <laughs> so you're you know you want ncaa indoors you want outdoors obviously it's been a long season for you and for a lot of these ncaa athletes competing at trials i mean that's that's a long season so for you like how did you kind of manage some of that load and i mean again shoot you pr there and made the team and you know your final race there so um, you know, how did you kind of manage some of that physical um, and mental aspect of that, having already raced a whole bunch this season? Yeah, it's definitely hard. I feel like coming to the trials, racing a lot of pros who, like, haven't been racing a ton and, like, haven't been racing for as long as, like, us college athletes have been. But honestly, I feel like once I got to the trials, like, it felt like I could finally just focus on running because, um, like, for outdoor nationals, we were still in school. Like, I literally had, like, final exams the day before, like, the 800 final, which is not fun. Um, but I feel like it didn't really feel like I had been running for as long because it felt like I was very focused on school up until that moment. So once I came here, I was like, oh, wait, now like I can finally just like focus on the running part. Um, so, yeah, I feel like that kind of helped. And I think, you know, you being at Stanford, you have such a great women's team that, you know, enables, you know, you and your training and how much of the, the, the collegiate system kind of has incubated your growth in a way. Yeah, definitely a lot. I feel like, yeah, we have a very talented team. Um, in a lot of different like aspects. I feel like a lot of us bring a lot of different like strengths um, to the team, which has been like very cool to be able to like, kind of help each other out. You know, like I'm able to train with like Lucy Jenks, who's like a 5K runner, but like she really helps me on like the endurance. And then like I do like 50s and wickets with like Roisin and all of our like shorter, like 400, 800 runners. Um, so I feel like it's been so special to be able to, you know, work with such a special group of women who are really just, you know, helping me get faster and better. Mm -hmm. Julia, can you just describe the emotions throughout the course of each of the rounds? I, I felt like I was there for every single round because you have to come through yes. the mix. So then I see you in the content lounge. But, like, the first round, I gave you a hug. You were feeling great. Semifinals, like, you were back there with me as we watched the race together. And you're like, Liv, did I make it? And I'm, like, refreshing. And I'm like, I think you're okay. And then, like, we just hugged each other. And then, like, the finals, we were just, in like, tearing up in the back as we're just talking about, like, what to look forward to. So from your perspective, just – kind of the roller coaster of emotions what were you kind of feeling throughout the course of each round and like when those nerves kicked in and I know you told me like the semifinals was the hardest round just how do you contain all of that so you can get to the line and do what you need to do yeah definitely a big roller coaster of emotions <laughs> like the first round you know I felt like pretty confident going into it you know they were taking the top six I think it was as big cues so I felt like pretty good going into it and coming out of it I also like felt good and legs felt good um, I feel like the semifinal is always the one I just get most nervous for just because, you know, like all you want to do is like get to the final and like the semi, it's hard because like you cut down so many people, like it goes from, I don't even know, like 27 to nine or yeah. something like that. Um, so a lot of people get cut out and that's also as far I've ever, as far as like I've ever made it in like the past like trials um, and then USA's last year. So I really, I think going into the semis just really wanted to make it to the finals. So I think I had a little more like expectation going into that race. Um, so definitely a little more nervous, but then once I got out of that and yeah, it was definitely like a long waiting game going in the first heat and like not really knowing what everyone is running. But I feel like after each like 400 for each of the next like heats, I feel like I could kind of tell, you know, what they were going out in um, if I'd be safe or not. Um, and so once, once we found out in the, in the back room that I made it, I was like, oh, okay, that's a relief. Like I can take a breath. And then at that point it was honestly just like so much excitement for the final. I was like, I've never been in a final before. And like, I kind of knew, you know, regardless of how it turned out, like it was going to be a fast race. And like, I was really excited for the idea that I could PR. Um, cause yeah, again, like I said earlier, like I hadn't PR'd since high school and I really wanted to like, you know, finally show like where my fitness has felt, um, and not necessarily how my times have kind of shown. 
Um, so yeah, it was really just like a lot of excitement going into the final. And even though you're just in your second year at Stanford, you've been to the trials before. I mean, you competed here when you were a high schooler. Can you kind of comment and reflect on like where you've come since then, you know, comparing, you know, almost that journey, right? Like from where you were in high school, competing at the trials to where you are now. Yeah, yeah. I feel like they are very different experiences. I feel like when I came into high school, like I was just so content with just like being here and I was like, I made it to the trials, like, oh my gosh, that's insane. And I was like, I don't even care how I do, like I'm here. Um, and like there I made it to the semifinals, which is really exciting. And I was almost like, I think I was one of the first few um, out to not make the finals. So I think I was very excited about that. But I feel like this time um, I definitely came into the, like, the meet, like having a lot like clear like goals for the meet, like not just kind of being content with where that I just was just like here, but I really like wanted to do something while I was here. Um, and I feel like, you know, having just those goals like really helped me a ton. Um, and also I feel like when I was here as a high schooler, like I definitely like had a lot of like imposter syndrome and was like, I don't know if I belong here. Like I, it was just like a weird feeling like being down in like the check-in area and I'm like looking around and seeing all these people that I've looked up to and I like have watched on TV and now I'm like racing them and I was like this feels wrong like I don't know if I should be here and I feel like this year you know to a certain extent I still always have that like fangirl moment but I feel like this year I definitely felt a little more like you know I belong and can kind of you know fight with these big dogs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, like, do you think then you know transitioning to the collegiate stage like helped you kind of I don't know if overcome imposter syndrome is the right word, but like kind of get more used to be like, hey, I can compete with all these people out here. Yeah, definitely. I feel like especially with how like competitive it's been in the collegiate scene, like I was almost more nervous and like intimidated, I feel like, than at nationals than I was here at like the trials, just because yeah, obviously everyone's been doing insane um, on the NCAA level. So I feel like that really helped me prepare for like what these big meets like the trials. The sport is changing uh, dramatically. There are athletes as young as 16. Uh, maybe Quincy <laughs> Wilson comes to mind. You know, up to 25, Noah Lyle, Shakari Richardson, who are now leading this sport, you're in that demographic. Uh, how do you think the sport is changing right now as you see it? Yeah, it's changing a ton. I swear every, every race, it's just like more and more barriers are being broken and more glass ceilings are being shattered and like so many expectations that you never really thought would be possible to like kind of, you know, break through are happening and it's just like, it's very exciting. It's also like sometimes I'm like, dang, like I, I wish I was running like a few years ago, you know, when like a 159 would have easily won nationals or things like that. But I think it's just very exciting and it's like exciting that we all are just like pushing each other a lot um, and just kind of like, yeah, breaking barriers together. Mm -hmm. I know your final was on Monday, so the, I like to call it the first half of trials, and here we are in the second half. So you're kind of here and actually able to enjoy, as you were telling Ashley and I, like, I, I told you when you walked in, I was like, you look well rested. You're like, I've been sleeping, <laughs> catching up on sleep. So what has been your favorite event to see so far, and which final are you looking forward to the most to see as we're wrapping up these U.S. Olympic trials? Yeah, I think my most exciting one that I watched was yesterday in the women's steeple final. Um, it was very fun to watch. I was sitting with like the whole on group, so we were cheering for Olivia and Courtney, obviously, and it was so exciting to watch them. Heartbroken for Olivia, but she killed it and has had an incredible season. Um, but coming up, I feel like definitely the 1500 women's final. I'm excited to watch. Yeah, I don't really know what's going to It's a talented <laughs> field, so I have no idea who is going to get it, but I'm excited to cheer on. I'm excited for that one, too. You mentioned on, you know, I, I kind of want to ask you about that, too. Like, you were one of those first, I feel like, part of the, that first group of athletes, like when, you know, track athletes were starting to sign NILs that you signed with on and there's a bunch of people at Stanford that are you know involved with on too like can you talk a little bit about like what that partnership has been like and kind of being one of those um, one of those faces within the collegiate scene you know with NIL deals yeah it's been so exciting I felt like very honored to be like the first on signing um, and yeah it was just like really exciting because again like you were saying like it was kind of the beginning of NILs and track um, specifically and yeah it's just been exciting to work with them it's been exciting all the people I've gotten to meet from it like just even this past week like the amount of like connections that I've gotten to like me and have through on and working with them has been just so cool and I've gotten to hear like so many different stories and meet people that I probably wouldn't have met um, without it and it's been really fun yeah having like a few on people um, on the team it's like funny when we all get like our shipments of like like clothes and stuff to the package center like we all leave with like so many boxes and there's just so many of us so it just looks like an on like I don't even know like 
factory, <laughs> but it's been very exciting. And yeah, I'm very, very grateful for their partnership. Didn't Zendaya, Zendaya just yes. sign with yes. What are your thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, so exciting. I love Zendaya. <laughs> I Everyone like messaged me after like, are you gonna get to meet her? And I was like, I don't know, am I? Like, that'd be so cool. So maybe, we'll see. I Yeah, I'm obsessed with her, so that's cool. Curious, uh, what's been your favorite conversation that you've had athlete to athlete with somebody you may not have expected to speak to while you were here oh that's a good one um I mean I talked to like Noah Lyles before um when we were doing like pre-meet because he's like close family friends with my coach um coach Clark and so he like came up to me and Roisin and was just like very nice. Like, I kind of, like, didn't really think he knew who we were. Like, I don't know. I was, like, fangirling, and I was like, wait, is he coming up to us, Roisin? And he was like, you guys don't have to be so nervous because we looked, like, so scared because <laughs> we were just like, is this happening? But he was just so nice and just, like, was like, I've been watching you guys since high school. Um, and, like, he was just like, good luck. And then, like, every time I saw him after that, he was like, like, go get him. And then I saw him in team processing, and he was like, amazing job. So, yeah, it's been fun to kind of talk to him after well, what, cheering for him. What's his star power in your eyes right now? I mean, he's obviously grown a lot. Do you feel like he's become sort of the top of the sport in terms of star power? Yeah, I honestly do. I feel like a lot of people know who he is. Um, even, like, out of the sport, I feel like a lot of my friends, like, in other sports or even just not even sport in general like know about him and yeah I feel like he's he's a fun entertainer to watch so <laughs> it helps the sport a lot. <laughs> My final question to you is how's your French? Not great. Not great? I know bonjour <laughs> <laughs> and je m'appelle Juliette. I think is my name is Juliet, but that that's kind of it. Yeah, I, I only know Spanish and Dutch, but I don't think they're that similar. Interesting, you know Dutch? Huh. Yeah, we, this past year, I had to do like the language requirement for school and I didn't, like, I don't know. I'd done a lot of Spanish like in elementary school and high school. Um, so I kind of wanted to try something new and Dutch is the only language that's two days a week instead of five days a week, but it's for longer. So it's like two hours for like two days and I was like oh I'll miss a lot less because like if I did Spanish like I would have missed like so much for traveling like from Wednesday Thursday Friday and would have had to make up all of them and so like our team like Kai Robinson like he first got like he was like everyone take Dutch like he got very excited about it so then I was like okay like why not so like me Kai Leo Lex Amy Bunnage like there's a group of nine of us on the team in the class that's 11 people and when we first walked in our professor was like are you guys like in the right class? Cause she's used to only having two people like ever in the class. And so we showed up and there's like 11 of us. So it's been very fun, but yeah, we, we learned some Dutch. So. so I guess everyone at Stanford on the track team can speak Dutch. Yeah. Okay, interesting, good to know. Honestly. <laughs> That's so awesome. You can chat with Femka, right? Yeah, exactly. I know. I'll get right? to use it. Yeah. That should be funny. Be funny. And you probably need to set that up somehow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. I would love that. I actually have another. I know you said you had your final question. Yes. I have a final question. Okay. I know you've been here. It's kind of a unique experience because you get to share this Olympic trials experience with your sister as well. Um, she'll likely, you know, can make the relay pool in that in that 400. So what has that been like? Just being here with her and potentially could also be, you know, going to Paris together. Yes. Oh, I was hoping you would ask me about her. I love talking about her in my interviews. Um, but yeah, it's been so fun having her here and just like so comforting because we both actually like ran at the trials three years ago. But at that point, the 400 was in the earlier section and then the 800 was in the later section. So it didn't really feel like we were running at the same time. Um, but this year or like this trip has just been like so fun to have her and like even just like looking around like the warm up area and like seeing her there just added so much like comfort. And I was like, wait, like there's my sister. Like the, the, at the end of the day, like it's not that deep. Like we're just here like running around, having fun. Um, and yeah, it's just been, it's been nerve wracking. I feel like I've gotten more nervous for her than I have for any of my races. Um, and I was like luckily able to like watch all of her races, like either like after or before mine, I would run out to the track um, and watch her races. So they were very stressful, but just so exciting. And just like, I don't know, just very fun and to watch and just made me very proud um, of her. And yeah, now I'm excited, hopefully crossing our fingers that we'll be in Paris together. Um, Cause that would just be so special and we want a room together. So it'd be fun. <laughs> so awesome. Do you have one final goal that you want to achieve at the Olympics? Oh. Not as much like an outcome goal, but I just like really want to go into it with confidence and like, you know, knowing that like 
I belong here, you know, just as much as anyone else and I've earned my spot here. So just trying not to like, you know, get too intimidated by, you know, the giant crowds, the fact that it's the Olympics, um, you know, who's in the race, like at the end of the day, like it's just another 800 and I've done a hundred of those. So, you know, how hard could this one be? <laughs> Juliet, we are just so excited to watch you in Paris. I know Brian and Ashley will be there, so you'll oh, see awesome. them. Familiar faces in the yes. mix zone. But Juliet, we're wishing you and Bella all of the best. <laughs> and congratulations on just everything you've accomplished so far. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, you guys, so Thursday marked the return of Arian Knighton in that 200 meters after it was revealed that he was cleared by USADA following a suspension due to a presence of a banned substance in an out-of-competition drug test. So Knighton was given no-fault violation on June 19th and raced eight days later. So that 200, he just, I assumed he walked right through the mix zone because I didn't see him in the content lounge. But other than that, Knighton is back. And he looks good, it's just coming off of that first round. Yeah, but this will be a story, you know, until the end of the trials, mm -hmm. because we, as reporters, are, you know, looking to find out, you know, what exactly happened with that issue. He was suspended, there was no word on it, and now he's racing. So, I mean, we have to give him the benefit of the doubt, allow him to get through his rounds and make a team, but, like, I think there will come a point in time when we're going to have to start asking the questions and, and trying to get some answers from Arian himself. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's definitely, this is gonna be a conversation until it's kind of been nipped in the butt, as we would say. Like, we just kind of need to hear from, you know, from him, like how he probably felt throughout this, the course of this. And especially, cause we were all talking about, I was like, wait, when did he, when was he suspended? When was he banned? Cause I never heard anything up until it was released that he was fine. I was like, wait, when did all of this happen? So it was just, just a crazy time. Yeah, I mean, really the only information we have is from that press release that USADA posted, and it basically just went along the lines of, hey, there was a case, there's, you know, an independent, you know, arbitrator that ruled that, you know, gave him the no-fault violation due to the fact that it was, I, I think after the, the case, the, the arbitrator said that it was likely, the, the presence of the banned substance was likely due to uh, contamination of meat, like beef or something that used. A burrito. <laughs> Not a burrito. Wasn't it a burrito? He that ate, was, ate that, something, didn't he? That's Shelby Houlihan, the burrito. I thought he also ate a burrito. Oh, I, I did say nothing about the burrito. I just heard meat. Yeah. Okay. I well, don't know from where. there's meat. There's meat. It's happened more than once in terms yeah. of, you know, contamination in meat. Um, I'm no scientist. I'm sure Arian is no scientist as well. So it'll be kind of hard to kind of figure out how does this happen? Um, but it, I mean, he's, he's, he ran the second fastest time yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, he looks the same Arian as he was. And, it's going to be a fight for him to kind of get to, to that, that top spot, the top three, but I think he has a shot uh, when you look at the roster there. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, he looked very smooth in his, his first round 2015 to win his heat ahead of Christian Coleman. But I like that you mentioned, I feel like this one, I mean, we already saw a surprise in the 100, right? Like, I think the 200, there's still plenty of players involved that someone's going to get left out, right? I mean, you look at this, you have Noah Lyles, uh, Kenny Bednarik, uh, Courtney Lindsay. Um, you know, Christian Coleman, like the list goes on. So some of those guys are going to get left off this 200 team. Um, and obviously, Knighton, he's making his season debut. Mm -hmm. um, but he still looks smooth right now. So. Yeah. Um, like you said, and kind of Juliet alluded to this, too, like you go from the top six, you know, from the round all the way down to nine. So it's like everyone kind of made it through. We were even looking at it yesterday. Like every single yeah. woman that towed the line in the 200 yeah. meters yesterday all made it through. You so just needed to run. That's one of the drawbacks of USATF putting together the schedule that um, imitates the Olympic Games because when you don't have the field size, it looks awkward. It looks unorthodox. Like everyone's through. Like it doesn't make sense to have three rounds when everybody's basically through, but they're trying to simulate what the Olympic Games are. That's the purpose of this in, in general. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get basically the same field again in the semifinals. Yeah. So. Yeah, pretty much. And if you think about Brian Dybul, um also brought up a valid point, like they're also racing for lane assignments at this point. So it's like, I totally get it. But at the same time, like every single person <laughs> made it through. So again, we're just gonna look forward to seeing Arian Knighton and the rest of the crew in this 200 meters um, as we look forward to the rest of the championships. But let's move on because we did have a final yesterday. It was a women's 3000 meter steep of chase, which was absolutely insane. I know Juliet was talking about that was her favorite event so far of these championships that she was able to watch. But to watch it in the back, 
it, again, anything happens at the Olympic Games, but Ashley, what are your just overall thoughts of the race? I mean, yeah, I was out there watching and going into that final lap, I knew it was going to be crazy. I mean, there were four, essentially four ladies, four or five ladies in contention for three spots. Um, so I knew it was going to come down to the finish, but Val Conti, goodness gracious. I mean, she looked so strong and she was able to pull away there at the end. A year after suffering an ACL injury, she comes to the trials, sets a meet record, 903-22. You think about all, you know, Emma Coburn, Courtney Furyk, like these ladies that I've raced here before, but it's Val Conti that, that sets the meet record. So I feel like that says something about her performance here. But again, that final lap was just absolutely wild, especially that, that final water jump. Um, we saw Olivia Markovic, she, you know, formerly of Notre Dame, now with on. Um, she almost like it almost looked like she kind of stepped awkwardly and almost like hyperextended her knee in a way off that water jump, and I think that kind of just tripped her up a little bit. And then over that final barrier, I think she was in fourth or third, and she kind of stumbled and fell to the ground after that. Um, so again, just so many different things happening. But but kudos to Markovic too, though she she still PR'd though, even despite wow. falling and moves to number three on the all-time collegiate list. Um, but the, your, your team here, it's Val Constein, uh, Courtney Wayman, and Marissa Howard, who I think is one of the biggest surprises so far of the trials. You picked Val to win. I did, yes. Congratulations. Appreciate Round of applause. It. Appreciate what was your, because that 903.22 is absolutely insane. I know you mentioned, like, Emma Coburn, she had the meet record with a 909, so six seconds yeah. to shave that. It was incredible. But what were your thoughts when you saw Val cross that finish line? Well, you look at her uh, 1K splits throughout, very even, very consistent, and she really hammered uh, the last 1K to get it done. I mean, 254 over the last K, that's, that's going to get it done in a championship final there. So she was absolutely the best woman on the day. Kudos to her. I did want to comment on Marka Zich, uh in that gut punch, basically. Mm. Um, I was able to talk to her coach at Notre Dame, director of track and field and cross country, Matt Sparks, and I said, hey, man, like, what are your feelings after this? And he said that in the lead up to the trials, they had prepared uh, so thoroughly for this moment, doing a lot of speed work, 200 meter splits to simulate what that last stretch will be, 33 seconds or 34 seconds over the hurdles. And they had gone through it over and over and over. What you can't prepare for is the lactic you feel in your legs when this race is under 910. Like you just can't do that. So she came to a period where you just had to kind of deal with it. And it's, Gut wrenching because she was in a position to qualify. You know, I think after the water jump kind of escaped her. Um, but he said it was just sort of tough to see. He did say Olivia had no tears, no regrets. She walked right to the, the mix zone, talked to every reporter there. I mean, that is class, through and through from her to be able to talk to people after a, a heartbreaking effort like that. So, um, got to give her props for that. But yeah. Howard, let's talk about Howard. Yeah. Howard, unsponsored athlete. You know, obviously she, she has the Tracksmith kit, but she's not making a ton of money, you know, f to run. Mm -hmm. So w what are your thoughts on, on her spot? I thought she did a fantastic job. Again, when we just think about that last 100 meters, it was Weymouth, um, Markovich, and then Howard was in that mix, but she was just able to pull through all the way through 907. I think you had Marissa. In your did you have her in the top three? You had her in the top three. No one had her. In the I don't top think three. anyone have, I I, had I her. I thought someone had her in the top three. I, I think I had Mitchell, Kaylee yeah. Mitchell. Okay, Mitchell. Yeah, I heard yeah. an M, and I was like, yeah. oh, y'all got something because yeah. I picked Corey Women in yeah. top three. I don't three. think anyone could have predicted this because coming mm. into this, <clears throat> Marissa Howard had a 9.22 lifetime PR. Insane. And then she comes away with a 9.07 PR to to make the Olympic team. Like it's one of those moments where, like, she just had the race for life right there, and it's probably one of those things in the moment where. Um, you're not even thinking about it. You're just going out there and you're just, you know, just going, you're just hammering it through. You know what I mean? And it, it get, like, just crazy. And again, I think it's, it's really cool because, you know, she is, you know, she has that partnership with Tracksmith, you know, um, I believe she's a mom as well. And so to come out here and put together just a great performance. So awesome. she was formally sponsored by Ozell. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that ended, that sponsorship ended and she's been sponsored you know, with, with some gear and, and some some support from Tracksmith over the last year. But out of Boise, Idaho, um, is a mom. I think what she said, one thing that had limited her opportunity to get a new sponsorship was the fact that she wasn't going to move from Boise. She wants to train there. Uh, that's what she's married. She has a husband and, and, and a kid, as you said. I mean, her life's there. So that's kind of 
prevented that from happening. But she also said that she knew she was capable of 907 based on everything that she had done training wise. She has a, a partner that's going to be competing at the Br British Olympic trials um, coming up. And I think she just had this belief in herself. Um, but these are the stories out of the trials that we all care about, right? It's the people who are not expected to make the teams that have these uh, extraordinary efforts to get there. And Tracksmith is, is a good, I think, supporter of these athletes, you know, mm -hmm. kind of giving them some, you know, however big or small support to, to help them go after the dreams. So. I couldn't agree any better. A huge fan of Tracksmith over here and what they're doing for the sport. And I know we had Russell join us earlier. So um, just to see them building and supporting these athletes, I think is amazing. Well, I want to go back to Courtney Wayman because she did finish uh, second in this race with a 906. I, I know I told you guys last night I had a chance to see her in that content lounge while she was getting her photos done. And I was able to talk to Coach Taylor off to the side. And I said, how are you feeling? Like, how are you doing? And she was like, I'm just so full of emotion. Like, you don't know what it feels like to coach your very first Olympian. And I was like, that is just incredible. And the fact that Courtney came over and I said, can I chat with you? And she's like, absolutely. And we talked and uh, she told me that she's like, hey, I after she finished fourth at the 2021 Olympic trials, she told Coach Taylor, I want to be somewhat on this journey with you. I want you to coach me through. It wouldn't be the same. So, boom, Coach Taylor got into coaching pros. So, that's kind of how all that started. So, she's like, this is more than just me being an Olympian. We're both Olympians. And so, I thought just that support system, we all know Coach Taylor's – very passionate about the sport where I'm a huge fan of Coach Taylor myself, so I'm really excited to see both of them make this team. And I think we have a strong team for this 3,000 meter steeplechase and great storylines all around across the board in this event. So another final that happened on Thursday, the women's discus. Okay, Val Allman doing Val Allman things. Can anybody, my big question is, can anybody stop her in Paris? Like that's the big question for me. I mean, she looked really good. I mean, I, w I was out there watching all her, her whole series, and that last throw was just a monster throw there. She threw 70-73 on her sixth and final throw of the competition to just solidify her win yet again. And, like, goodness, like, when she gets going, like, she really gets going. And I think she's by far the favorite to win the Olympic gold. You know, I think another thing, too, that I found interesting was, you know, looking listening to her interview afterward, you know, she's like, compared to 2021, this almost feels like I made my first Olympic team here because yeah. 2021, it's like, you know, there were no fans. She couldn't have her family there. Like, you're just kind of, you know, out there alone. And she's like, I'm just excited to say, say have like, you know, my nephew out there cheering me on and stuff like that and having her whole contingent with her in Paris. And so I think she's looking forward to that and having a lot of that energy around field events too in Paris. Yeah. I love how you mentioned that her, her last throw was the best throw. When you look at the results, like she could have won off of her th first throw, which yeah. was 67.19 uh, meters. And I chatted with her afterwards. I was like, how do you just kind of keep pushing? Just knowing you're so dominant in this event. She's just like, she just appreciates competition and she takes full advantage of every throw. Um, she said she's going to go to a Paris Diamond League meet, I believe. And then there's another maybe meet between then and the Olympics. So she's still trying to, you know, work on some fine tuning things. But right now it's crazy to think she is the second best thrower in the world behind uh, Perez, who's a Cuban, who went 73 meters, uh, 73.09 meters. So again, she's the defending Olympic champion. I know you mentioned like this one feels like the true one, but we're just rooting her on. Be because uh, because the last Olympics was a very different experience right. with COVID yeah. in Tokyo. I mean, a lot of athletes have been commenting on that where 2021, they, they were there, but it didn't feel the same way that they're right. going to experience in Paris. So um, that's one thing that she will have to, you know, come into and I think uh, embrace. Very, very consistent. Almond's one of the most consistent throwers in the world, the most consistent thrower in the world. You know, a couple 69-meter throws earlier in the year at Diamond League meets, 70-meter throws now here. It will take a, a, a remarkable effort from somebody to be here, I think. That's the only way she loses, if, yeah. if somebody comes away with a huge out of this world throw because we know what we're going to get from Valerie. Valerie is good enough to win on any given day. Mm -hmm. Now you can't really prepare for what someone else is going to offer, but I think she's a good shot. He's probably one of the favorites here. Absolutely. All right, you guys, the final, final <laughs> for the day is the 110 meter hurdles. And of course it's going to feature athletes like Grant Holloway, Daniel Roberts. We have Freddie Crittenden's in there. Trey Cunningham's been looking smooth throughout the course of the rounds. And 
Um, if we talked about this yesterday, and if we were talking about dark horses, JQ Scott was one of them, and I'm not biased because I'm an Aggie, but he's been looking <laughs> very, very I strong. No, I'm being that. serious. JQ has been, Brian and I, we went on a workout together, and we saw JQ during the indoor season. I'm like, okay, this guy, solid. Uh, that's kind of biased. <laughs> no, I'm being, I'm being serious, but how do we see this kind of shaking out? I know Ashley mentioned earlier in the week. I Actually, have one thing written down absolutely. here. That's I'm the gonna, only thing I have written yes. down for this segment. World record watch question yeah. mark. Yes. Like yes. I think I know we like you yeah. said, I talked about this earlier this week. Like, I mean, Grant Holloway went twelve ninety two in the first round, twelve ninety six yesterday in the semis. He's just looking really smooth and I mean, why not? Is it yeah. twelve seven two? Is yeah. that the world record? Twelve eighty by Aries Merrick okay, back okay. in two thousand twelve. Okay. <sighs> like you said, just consistent. He put on a show that first prelim, we're like, ooh, that's that's moving. Yeah. World lead, again, another sub-13 second performance. So we know that Grant Holloway works under pressure. I don't know if he feels it, but it feels like every time he toes the line, he just knows how to handle his business. So I'm going to say yes. Yeah, I agree. I think we could see something very special from Grant considering you know, what he did in the first round. All business, not playing around. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at the team, though, you, I, for me, it's the tried and trusted guys tried and tested guys that are going to probably make this team if I have to pick. Daniel Roberts has been to so many, you know, world championships. He's been to an Olympic championship. Um, he's probably the next best guy beside Grant to, to go on this team. Um, third one, probably Trey. But Trey's kind of been up and down in some of these U.S. Olympic trials uh, events before. So he's going to have to lock in. And he's, he's talked about maybe, um, you know, leading into – these trying moments, getting himself ready and prepared. Sometimes you have those like periods of plateau. He, he compared it to writer's block almost in a mm. way when he was training. You, you have a little bit of that writer's block, but then you come back in it and he feels really good and, and mentally focused. Um, I think those three make the team. I think it's Grant, Daniel, Trey. Mm. But if we are going to offer some wow cards, Crittenden, See, yeah. I don't even think he's a wild card. I, I have him in my top three now. Do you? Based on how I've Do seen you? him perform. Uh, yeah, he looked really good yesterday in his semifinal. I think he ran 13.05 for a season's best. And he was he was pumped. Like, he, he finished yeah. the race. You could tell that he was like, man, like, I've hit my stride. And, I mean, shoot, if he keeps that going, like, yeah. I think he can. And he's also, I mean, he's going to be in lane seven. Grant Holloway's in lane six. You can kind of feed off a little bit of that momentum of him ahead of you, maybe. Cordell's the only other guy. Yes, I'm I was going to mention him. I'm a huge Cordell guy. He's been sort of underlooked most of his career and he's risen over the last year plus and I think he he could make a team with a great race but he's going to need a great race to get on this team mm, man okay so top picks so you said Grant Holloway Daniel, Daniel Roberts. Roberts Trey Cunningham yeah I think so and then yours is all that go, but Freddie third? actually I'm gonna go Holloway Crindon Daniel Roberts interesting what are you going? Just don't put him around horses is what I learned yesterday. <laughs> Terrified of horses. I'm gonna I'm on the same wavelength as Corey, and I just pulled up like what I said going into trials, so I'm sticking with it. So Grant, Daniel Roberts, Trey Cunningham. I need Trey Cunningham to have the race of his life. But I'm also rooting for Freddie. I think that's my 3B pick. I know I've been doing that. Ooh. 3B. But I'm, I'm Trey Cunningham third. 3A. Wow. 3A. Wow. You got to pick three. Trey Cunningham. Okay, okay. We're going Fine. with that. Fine. All right, so that's our only final for today. So it's kind of a lighter, lighter final day, but we have a lot of first rounds. So women's javelin, men's hammer, women's 100-meter hurdles, uh, women's pole vault, men's triple jump, women's shot put. We're going to have semis of the women's 15, which is the event that Juliet's looking forward to the most. Uh, can I ask one question before we leave? Can I, can I finish this first and then you can ask your question? And then yeah. men's 400 meter hurdles, men's 800, women's and men's 200, and then the finals are tonight. Yeah. Question. Men's 800, do we think we're gonna run a 142 like Bryce oh. suggested? No. no, I don't think so. That's, that's pretty that's, freaking that's fast. That's freaking moving. He yeah. said 142 though. What about a 143? Oh yeah, I think, I think, you know, I think 143 high is very reasonable. If we, if if they want to run 142, someone's going to have to get out like a rocket and just push the pace, like literally right from the break. That's the only way that happens. But maybe they do. Maybe they like they. Maybe someone does do that because they see what happened to a thing Mo in the the women's finals when it was so bunched together. So maybe that is the move to go fast. I don't know. 
but I don't think it's going to be 142. I say 143. Do you think 142? Well, it'll be electric. If it's 142, I'm having a day. I think. <laughs> I think. Um, I think he's. He looked so confident yeah. yesterday. He yeah. looked like he was chilling. Now that there, there's good and bad to that. Like sometimes you're not showing your full self there, but I, I think he's confident because he knows he can do something special. So he was Jay chilling, yeah. and yeah. then he's gonna ramp it up, yeah. and then just be like, bam. Yeah. And and I. I asked Isaiah Harris the same thing. I said, hey, do you think you know this is going to go 142? Bryce mentioned it. He's like, no. <laughs> it's probably going to be 144. I'll give him it. If he can go that, that, that fast, I'll give it to him. But like, the way this usually plays out is 144 low. You know, obviously, it's a fight for your life in the championship. Do you think he would, when you asked, was it like a straight face or did he like chuck a little bit? It was, was, a, like, it was a straight no. face. It was a straight <laughs> face. So he I, went, like, no. Yeah. <laughs> Isaiah has been a 144 guy for, I was looking at his resume for like 10 years now, eight, eight years. He understands how to race, but I mean, he hasn't gotten to that. I mean, 142, like very few men have gotten to that. Um, it's, but I don't know, you know, that, that puts people in uncomfortable positions. If you, if you try to make that bold pace, you know, you create that pace, it, it puts people out of position and really out of the race. If, yeah. if it becomes that. You're not wrong. So. So wow. you're pulling up some, some rankings Yes, right I'm now. like, can I look? Is there a way season? A this countries. is 2024. Yeah. Wait, actually, I'm going to let you take control. We're, We're going to look, look at something real quick. quick. I just want to. What are you trying to look at? I'm just trying to see. There's only been three men in the world so far this year that have gone sub 143. Yeah. yeah. Bryce Hopple has gone 143.68 for number seven in the world so far in mm. 2024. There you go. I, I say 143. I'm still sick about yeah, that. If I see a 142, I'll probably pass out. Yeah. Like, you won't hear from me. <laughs> Where's Liv? Passed out somewhere. Okay? All right, you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, double tap on Instagram, retweet the stuff on X, do all the things. So thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you inside Hayward Field.